most exciting things in all the world is birth. My wife and I have been privileged five times to go to the hospital and welcome a new little one into our family. And uh, that's just, that's one, of the, that's one of the most awesome things in the world. Now, we've been blessed four times uh, to welcome grandchildren into our family. Well, sometimes we'll sit around and we'll start talking and reminiscing and looking through old pictures. It's hard to believe that our kids have grown up and having kids of their own. There's something else that's pretty exciting, and that is the birth of a church. Sixty years ago, there was a church born, Fellowship Baptist Church. It's been my privilege to be a part of that church since I was three years old. For 53 years, I've watched the church grow. And to be honest with you, I catch myself sometimes going back mentally and just reminiscing about the things that I've seen God do and, and the many blessings He's bestowed upon us. That's why we're here today. And that's what this program is all about. We want to take some time just to go back in our minds and enjoy the blessings of God upon Fellowship Baptist Church. She's 60 years old, but let me tell you, she's alive and kicking. Uh, we are as excited about our future as we are about our past. I hope you enjoy taking these moments today and just becoming better acquainted or being reminded of the great Fellowship Baptist Church. Every day, there are countless children born somewhere in the world with little or no fanfare some are unwanted, and even those who are greatly loved by those closest to them are unnoticed by those who are outside of their circle of love. On an early March Sunday morning in a little community called Catsburg, in the city of Durham, North Carolina, there was a birth. It was 1956, and other than the 47 people who gathered in that one-room building that morning, no one even noticed that a church had been born. Fellowship Baptist Church was alive and well. I well remember that little building, well, about 25 feet wide, about 30 feet long. Oh uh, my, it was a little thing. The first service we had had eight people present, uh, me and Ira Howard and a lady and her youngins. And uh, I, I didn't understand, but uh, the first service was the Sunday morning. Now that was the first uh, time that they'd ever had Sunday morning service in that little church. The question about it, you know, see, a few days before that, I met with a group of people in that building, and somebody, the preacher, previous preacher, uh, had the building in his name, and he just sold it off under. So they said, preacher, we, we need to start a church back here, and we want you to be our preacher. Well, I talked to my pastor about it, Brother Wayne Smith. He said, well, if they want you to be the pastor, go ahead. Man alive, that was something for me. Uh, no education, no abilities, uh, no training, nothing else. But I said, okay, if that's what you want, we'll do it. This new church was conceived in the heart of a 30-year-old gypsy preacher named Lonnie Graves. Brother Lonnie, as he was affectionately called, was a man in whom the grace of God had been revealed in a miraculous way. Growing up, his family lived as nomads, wandering from town to town, eking out a living. Following his service in the United States Army during World War II, young Graves was discharged just outside Durham at a place called Camp Butner. There he met a young lady, married, and settled down in what was known as the Bull City. Through a miraculous set of circumstances, and due to the compassion of his neighbors, Lonnie Graves found himself in church under the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The conviction of God's Spirit began to work, and one night he accepted God's gift of eternal life. Not long after, he surrendered his life to the ministry. Birthing a church is never easy, and it wasn't easy for Lonnie and Goldie Graves. In addition to the normal challenges, Brother Lonnie was handicapped 
by the fact that he had received practically no education. He struggled to write sermons and had no idea how to build a church. One day, he discovered a newspaper called the Sword of the Lord. The Sword became his instructor, and the church became his laboratory. That little infant called Fellowship Baptist Church was alive, and she was growing. By the early 60s, Pastor Graves' burden to reach people with the gospel had greatly increased. As he sought ways to be more effective, he heard about churches that were using buses to bring people to hear the message of God's love. The burdened pastor led the church to purchase their first bus. Workers were trained, a driver was secured, and the Fellowship Baptist Church bus ministry was born. For more than 50 years, Fellowship Baptist Church has been bringing men, women, boys, and girls to church. Those who might never have heard the gospel have been given the opportunity because a church cared enough to bring them to church. Today, men and women serve in churches all over the nation who were reached through the bus ministry of Fellowship Baptist Church. Just as a growing child comes to the place where he needs a larger bed, different toys, and new clothes, a growing church creates its own needs. In 1963, and again in 1968, Fellowship Baptist Church had to build new buildings to accommodate its explosive growth. By the early 70s, their property on Hamlin Road could no longer service the needs of this young congregation, and property was purchased on the Highway 70 bypass. In 1973, the present auditorium was completed, and the church relocated to the highly visible site that has been its home for the past 33 years. At the time of purchase, Highway 70 was a four-lane divided highway which offered limited exposure to passers-by for the newly located church. Today, that same highway is an eight-lane freeway traveled by tens of thousands of commuters each day, with construction currently underway to greatly increase the flow of traffic in front of the church's present location. My name is Jimmy King, 1965, on a Tuesday night in April. Brother Lonnie and a guy named Andrew Shook came to our house on visitation. <clears throat> they led me and my mother to the Lord, and I started riding the bus with Brother Shook then. We didn't have a car, so it was the only way we had to get to church. So for the next three years, I rode his bus. Now it's my privilege to drive that same bus on that same route in East Durham, and I've been driving that bus since 1979. When I started, there was a, a tiny church out there on Hamlin Road. I probably seated about three or 400 people. I, I remember it was uh, all pine inside. I thought it was the prettiest place I'd ever seen. Then years later, they built another big auditorium. And then in the 70s, they moved out here to this church. And this property has continued to improve. And Brother, Brother Rick has turned it into a really, really beautiful piece of property. And we've also acquired the Freedom Hall, and that's a Another beautiful place. The Lord really blessed us and gave us a lot, of, a lot of nice buildings, a lot of nice property. We never could get, the traffic was so bad we could never get out on O'Walks for Highway Harley. And, uh, but we started, the Lord started blessing us so much. We had so many people coming. We didn't even have good seats or nothing. And we packed a pew every Sunday. And then when uh, we found out, we might be able to purchase this place over here. Uh, all the men got their axes and saws, and, and I got my scissors, and we came over <laughs> and cleared the land. And uh, so it was a great, you know, we were all excited about it. We were just so excited. And, and I was particularly because when we were over there, my husband drove a church bus, and we had to bring it home and park it in our yard. And uh, we pay the kids to wash our bus up. We give them a quarter a piece to wash up our bus for us. But, and then we were so excited when we finally moved, our bus route got larger and uh, we could leave the old big bus over here. And we, when we come in then, we didn't have to look around for a seat because it was seats everywhere, but people were just so happy and what God had done for us. and. Uh, 
we're still in a way he's really blessing us and he really did when bless us to be out here on highway 70 i think because just being out here side the road a lot of people ride by and see it. i actually was saved through the bus ministry in 1966 and started attending the church first service was on a wednesday night and when I walked in, I was amazed at the crowd and the spirit and the atmosphere. It was just awesome. And I attended church there until it just kept growing and we outgrew that building. And then a uh, preacher brought it before the church to build a bigger auditorium out behind that building. And we went through that growth and and then we actually needed another building, so Preacher brought it before the church to buy this property here on 70. And I remember when we bought this property and I would come out here and, and I would think, whoa, what a mess this is. Big rocks and tree stumps and gullies, and, but a lot of hardworking people and we just moved in and started cleaning the property up and taking care of it and then I remember we would come out, I would take my children and come out here and um, the children would get down there. And I remember Diana, I think was like six or seven years old and she would get down there and help Brother Vernon and Miss Ruby Castle move those big old rocks. And Don and the boys would get out there and help clear up. And it was just amazing to see how everything come to, to be and just cleared the property up and and then after the, the property was ready and the building got started, it was just, it was awesome. I would tell the children during the day, I'd say, let's get done with supper tonight so we can go out to the property and see how the building's coming. And we would come out here and just walk through. Um, I would start at one end of the building when they got the halls started and just walk. I remember Kathy was just a toddler, maybe two, three, I'm not sure. And I would hold her hand and we would walk all the way through and I would think, my, what a long hallway this is. This is awesome. And we would just walk through the hallways and just be amazed at, at what God was allowing us to have out here. And so it's just, it's been an awesome, I don't know, over 40 years here and just to, to see how it's grown and the different ministries. And uh, I just thank God every day that he allowed me to be a part of this great ministry. The growth of Fellowship Baptist Church subsided following the relocation to the Highway 70 property. The congregation endured some very difficult trials in the early 70s and again in 1980. Any growth that had taken place was negated as Fellowship Baptist Church endured two periods when people left in great numbers. The early to mid 80s were characterized by limited growth in the size of the congregation but not limited desire in the heart of her pastor. Lonnie Graves was looking for help, and he found that help within the walls of his church. Three years after the birth of the church, another baby was born. Philip and Dolores Finley welcomed their firstborn into their home. In 1962, Dolores visited Fellowship Baptist Church for the first time with her three-year-old son, Rick. FBC quickly became home to the Finley family. In 1963, the Finleys welcomed another baby boy into their home. Those two young boys would spend the rest of their lives attending Fellowship Baptist Church. As a matter of fact, today, those two boys are the senior pastor and the administrative pastor of the church. In 1988, the time had come for Lonnie Graves to retire from the full-time pastorate. When that day came, Fellowship Baptist Church turned to that little three-year-old boy to be their next pastor. On the first Sunday of March, Rick and Renee Finley stood before the congregation who lovingly welcomed them as their new pastor and pastor's wife. What they lacked in experience, the Finleys made up for in sincerity and desire. They had already spent five years investing in the lives of young people through their work as the youth pastor and the youth pastor's wife. Many of those teens had grown into young adults, and the Finleys had won the confidence of many of those teenagers' parents. 
the church since 1963. My, my wife has, and uh, uh, I've been here since 1965. We got married here, and uh, we've had both our children here and been privileged to uh, serve here We're under two pastors, uh, Dr. Lonnie Graves and uh, Dr. Rick Finley. I was called to be our pastor in 1988, I believe, and uh, that, that was, I think that was God. In fact, I know it was God. Uh, and we've had two special pastors in our life right there, and that's, that's Brother Lonnie and, and, and Brother Rick. And uh, he's been a, a special man to us ever since he's become our pastor. And we, we love him. And we're very proud of him and what he's, what he's done here and done at our church. And, and we look forward to many more years here with him. Well, hello, I'm John Wilson, and uh, I've been coming to the church, me and my wife and my family, for over 43 years now. I was here under Preacher Lonnie for many, many years, and God has really been good. He's been good to us. He's been good to everybody, and he's been good to the Fellowship Church. We're celebrating 60 years, and I remember building the church here. We cut green timbers and had to put them up that day so they wouldn't warp. I'm thinking about when uh, Dr. Finley was called to the church. He was a young man and uh, Preacher Lonnie was, was having people come in from all over the country. I mean, uh, big name preachers and all. Brother Rick was uh, our youth leader then and he had been for several years and um, I had I remember walking my mail route and praying about it I I've always had respect for him I saw him grow up and I saw him doing the the assistant pastor job and uh, I just always had respect for him because he's he's a good godly man and uh I lay awake thinking about it one night, and I remember after the preaching service, I, I went to preach to Lonnie, and I said, uh, Brother Lonnie, I don't, I don't know why you're going all over the country looking for somebody to take the church. I, I said, God has sent you a man right here. And uh, I, look, I looked over to Brother Rick, and Brother Lonnie said, we, I'm glad you told me that, because uh, I've been praying about that, and and I asked God to for somebody to say that, and that would reassure me that I was headed in the right direction. And and boy, I'm I'm glad I spoke up that night. A lot of times we speak up and we 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 mess up, you know, and we think we've made a fool out of ourselves. But but God wants you to speak when He puts something in your heart. So. Oh. Uh. I knew a year before I retired that my work was over. Uh, mainly because I was having to preach old sermons over again. That's the main reason. I, I was not getting new material. And I knew that, that uh, actually, I could almost hear, I didn't hear it, but I could almost hear God say, it's over. And I knew that I had to make some changes. I had been grooming the, uh, the, really, he was the assistant pastor, uh, Ron Dale, to take my place. Uh, Brother Rick was a youth worker, and you, I, I don't know whether he was a youth director then or not, I think it was. But anyway, he'd been working at church about four or five years, I guess. And he was a coming up young man. And I had really didn't have, hadn't thought that much about Brother Rick. But well, I got Brother Ron Dale to preach some sermons, and I said, there's something wrong here. I didn't know it, but he had a disease coming on. That showed up later. One of the, he was, by the way, one of the greatest Christian men I've ever known. I've often said if I was hanging over a cliff, I'd want him to hold the rope. A great man. And, uh, but, uh, I mean, it was almost God write me a letter, say, he's not the man. And then I, I, I don't remember how I came up with Brother Rick's th thought. I, by the way, I had some other preachers come in and visit. And it's almost, I, I could almost hear God say, that's not the one. That's not the one. 
And then uh, one guy came up, by the way, he, I think he still is editor for the Lord. He came up and uh, uh, he, uh, to, to try out, and he said, Brother Lottie, uh, I see a power struggle here. He said, you've got part of the church leaning towards Rick Finney and part of the church towards Juan Dale. I didn't realize it till then, but I realized that Rick Finney was in the play. And it's based on what Ron Dale was doing, his action, and his condition, I knew that something was taking place. So I, I, the hardest thing I ever done in my life was to go to Ron Dale and say, Ron, I've got to recommend somebody to take this church. And it's always been a, a, a thought that I'd recommend you. I want you to know I love you with all my heart, but I can't recommend you. I'm recommending Ron Dale. I mean, Norman Dale, or the, who, who, that fella, Rick Finley. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm recommending him to take the church. I said, he's young, he's coming up, he's got the education, he's got the ability. He can take it on. That's the hardest, it like to kill him. But he said, all right, Brother Lonnie. That, and by the way, when I got before the deacons, I said, he's the man. I don't remember, Brother Rick, exactly what key it was there was turn to set me on uh, that, but, but when I got with the deacons, uh, they, God had already been there. How God works miracles. And when I revealed to them my thoughts, uh, every one of them, I, not, only one, only one man, and he's in heaven now, he lived down east. And if I gave his name, you remember him. But anyway, only one said, I don't believe he's a man, I believe Ron Dale's a man. Uh, but he didn't give us a hard time. But I, based on that, they brought before the church the recommendation for Brother Rick Finney. And I must say, it's the greatest move ever made. It was God's move. It was God's time, Rick's time. It didn't take long for the church to hit a growth spurt. Fellowship Baptists accepted the challenge of a capital campaign. And $150,000 was raised for the installation of a new paved parking lot. Attendance began to climb from 425 to an average attendance of 750 per Sunday in just five years. Young couples began visiting the church. Word was spreading that Fellowship Baptist Church was moving forward. Evidently, Satan heard of it because in 1992, the church went through a very tumultuous time. In June of that year, hundreds of people left the church, causing much hurt and even divided families. Those difficult times proved to be a time of refining in the life of the church's young pastor. God's grace was evident in the life of Rick Finley and in the lives of the people whom he was chosen to pastor. The people who remained faithfully did the work of God. Although the early 90s were not easy years, they were still a time when the hand of God was evident in the church. Lawson Rickoff member uh, Fellowship Baptist Church. We came in 1982, our family, and uh, what a blessing it's been. And uh, of course our kids are not here right now. They're grown and making other things in their life. But uh, it's been a blessing to us, everything to do with uh, Brother Lonnie and especially the preacher. Uh, Sally Roycroft, um, I'm very thankful that we came to church here in December, I think was it 92, Ms. Lawson said. Uh, two small children, one was 10 and six. And uh, we came from a small church, um, Old Fashioned Tabernacle, uh, Pastor um, H.L. Mickle. And um, we were very happy, but we just um, thought it was a change for us that we needed. And we came here and it was huge. I remember that the church was so long, the auditorium was so long. And then I'll never forget when he was called to to be the pastor here. Uh, Brian and Tiffany were homesick, and Lawson was on the deacon board, so he knew what was gonna happen. So he called me between Sunday school and church and said, um, you need to be ready, I'm on my way home, and you need to be at church this morning. And of course, being an obedient wife, I got ready, and I came and I scooted in at the back, and it, church was almost over by the time I got here, but. I uh, scooted in the back, and they, that was the Sunday morning that we voted on uh, uh, Brother Rick, which now I call Always Preacher. 
but he was voted on and it was so ecstatic. I think the vote was like maybe 90 percent um, and everyone was so happy and I remember standing there, back there by myself because like I say my family and, and Lawson was at home and I thought to myself Lord I would love to work at this church and be preacher secretary. I never told anybody that. It was just a conversation that I had between me and the Lord. Little did I know in about um, a couple, maybe several months, maybe five, six months, preacher called and asked my husband if I would be interested. And I am so thankful that I've got to serve here at Fellowship now going on 27 years. Sitting outside preacher's office has always been such a joy. And I've been privileged to be able to, to um, see uh, our preacher up close. And he is truly, truly a man that loves people, all kinds of people. Uh, all, uh, he doesn't categorize them, but it's all kinds of people that he loves and he makes everyone feel comfortable and loved. He and Miss Renee as well. And um, I even remember uh, the unfortunate time when Satan reared his head and we had uh, um, people, good people on both sides um, saw the direction of the church and didn't agree. And um, Satan used um, his weapons that he always does, the, the same ones that in any church he uses. But I saw, and I saw up close, um, how preacher continued preaching the word, continued um, loving the people who chose not, at that particular time, chose not to love um, and support the church. But we've seen now, and we've been around long enough that we see the grace of God and how that he took his word and he took a preacher that loved people and uh, he has united our church. I remember we was going through the um, the ordeal, I'll call it the ordeal because we don't like to talk about it anymore and to us it's, it's a very far away memory. But Brother Fred Fabian, he came up with a slogan during that time that said, um, the best is yet to come. And I think about that for their 60th anniversary, how that we have a great heritage and two pastors, but the best is yet to come. And today, as we, or next week when we celebrate it, we're celebrating God's glory for the church. God had a vision and God had a plan and he had a purpose. And I'm so thankful that he let the Roycrofts be a part. And we love both of you, Brother Lonnie and Preacher. Thank you for your service. By the mid 90s, it was apparent to Pastor Finley that the Lord wanted the church to start a Christian school. In 1996, Fellowship Baptist Academy opened with four kindergarten students. Today, FBA is home to 137 students and a dedicated faculty. Years later, Fellowship Baptist Daycare was established in order to minister to area families and their little ones. That little baby named Fellowship Baptist Church had gotten her second wind and exciting things were taking place. Today, well in excess of 100 graduates are FBA alumni. What a thrill it is to see graduates of FBA returning to serve as teachers in the school. My name is Josh Finley and I'm Fellowship Baptist Academy alumni. I started going to school here when I was a kindergartner, uh, first, one of the first four students that the school had. And I went through all the way from kindergarten to 12th grade. I can remember Brother Ken and Brother Kevin, both specifically that had an influence in my life, one as a youth pastor, uh, the other as a coach, just all the time that they spent. And through high school, the different teachers I had, you could tell they really, they really loved you and they really cared about you and, and wanted what was best for you. And even though a lot of times you don't agree with their decisions or you don't agree with the correction, but you, you know that they love you and uh, they're making an influence on people's lives. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I saw as a teenager growing up and uh, being around Brother Kevin and uh, his influence that he had on the youth group and on my life and uh, Brother Ken and just seeing how they invested their lives in the young people. And it was one thing that really gave me the desire to invest my life in young people myself. 
Two more births took place in the mid-90s. Fellowship Baptist Church held her first Faith Promise Missions Conference in 1995. The dedicated members of FBC suddenly saw needs far beyond the limits of the city of Durham. The people began to give above their regular giving in order to send the gospel to the furthest regions of the world. Today, more than 120 missionaries receive financial and prayer support from Fellowship Baptist Church and her members. The gospel is being sent around the world from 515 Sutherland Street in Durham, North Carolina. Also in 1996, Fellowship Baptist gave birth to a ministry to Spanish-speaking people in the Triangle. God blessed the Spanish department in a great and mighty way. Hundreds of Hispanics heard the gospel, accepted Christ, and were discipled as new believers. In September of 2013, the FBC Spanish department became La Iglesia Bautista La Fe, a strong, autonomous, independent Baptist church with an average attendance of over 600 per Sunday. Not all of the Spanish-speaking people left with the new church. Many of them remain faithful and loyal members today and are doing their part to continue to help the church reach other Hispanics with the gospel of Christ. Hi, we're um, Pedro and Nelly Mata. We came to fellowship in 2005. Uh, we actually looked at several churches before coming here. Um, what called us to come here is when we came here, we actually spent the week at Preacher's house and felt very welcome at his house and felt that he had a heart for the Spanish ministry that was here. Um, we also put our children in the academy and our children, all three of them have graduated from Fellowship Baptist Academy and have went on to college. All of our children are in secular college, but we have never felt that our children have been left out because they did not choose a Christian college for their education. Uh, we have been here since 2005, and we absolutely love our church. We have been in the American service for quite a bit of time, and also the Spanish service, and we do feel welcome in both of the services. We feel like we have a lot of friends and more than friends, I would call them a church family. Um, we've been through a lot of trials the last year and have always got emails and text messages and felt loved by everybody here at the church. Um, Preacher has always had a heart for the Spanish, even um, reaching out to, especially Miss Renee, to teach him English and to try to put together a curriculum to help them be better at speaking English and understanding. Although a lot of the Spanish don't understand English, um, they have made the effort to get a system in so that we can translate to the people that don't know English so you can understand what is being preached by preacher. In 2008, God opened the door for Fellowship Baptist Church to purchase an old, abandoned, and dilapidated school property at 2418 Redwood Road. God had given Pastor Finley a vision that the Redwood property was a part of the future for the church. In November of 2008, friends and members of Fellowship Baptist Church gave $750,000 in cash and two-year commitments, and in January of 2009, the grounds and buildings on Redwood Road became the property of the church. Since then, the gymnasium has been completely renovated and Freedom Hall has become a very valuable tool for the ministry at Fellowship Baptist Church. The hall is home to Fellowship Baptist Academy Athletics as well as Freedom Sports Leagues, a program that has touched the lives of countless young people and one that has brought several families into the church. Approximately eight to nine years ago, uh, we found out about the property over at Redwood Road. And I remember uh, the excitement that we had. We had always known of the property. As a matter of fact, we had the opportunity to, pro to buy, purchase that property years prior, and the church was just not in a position to purchase. 
And when the property became available, I remember the, uh, I believe it was Thursday night prayer meetings, the men would go out and we'd lay on the uh, bank there at the softball fields and we'd pray uh, about the church purchasing the property and the excitement between my brother and I and we would talk about, uh, I told him, I said, you know, Brother Graves purchased the property on Highway 70 and just maybe the Lord wanted us to have that property and that would be kind of the stamp mark that the Lord had for our ministry in the purchase of that for the next generations to come behind us. We had owned the property about a year, year and a half or so and the preacher came to me and he said, uh, he felt like he was afraid that the, uh, the, the vision would die uh, of our people because we were not using the property, we were just paying for the property. And he met with me and he came to me and he, he said, I want for however long it takes, uh, I want to get something on that property we can use. So as you remember, we won the Kellogg's thing and we fixed the softball field. And the only problem with the softball field, we had nowhere for people to use the restroom. So he came back to me and he said, uh, you know, we really, we've got to do something that we can use that property and we can't go over and have activities because we don't have any work for people to use the restroom. And the gym, we could go in and turn on the lights. And he said, let's fix the gym. I think we could do that for the least amount of money. And he said, you have no other responsibilities with the ministry at the church. I just want to fix something. I want to fix the gym. And uh, I remember um, work nights and uh, anywhere from <clears throat> 60 to 90 men would show up and started out about once a month. And uh, I remember Brother John Pickens retired from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And he retired from there and became a contractor out of Redwood. And uh, me and him every day, six days a week, would go out to that property. I remember Brother Chris Carpenter bringing his crews over and uh, free of charge. He paid their labor. Uh, his guys would help work. And then just whenever we would run into a wall and we would have a large project, we went out to work night and we would have uh, countless men show up and uh, just the thing that touched me so much was to see God work miracle after miracle with that property. And now, um, years later, I think we've hosted uh, four state championships in that gymnasium. We've run, uh, this is our fourth Freedom League season. And to see how God has used just that one building. Uh, people's accepted Christ because of Freedom Hall. Uh, people have joined our church because of Freedom Hall. Uh, just about every year we've had Freedom Leagues. As a matter of fact, every year we've had Freedom Leagues. God has done something special. He's put children in our school. Uh, he's put people in our church. And most importantly, people have come to know Christ uh, because God gave us that property. The long-term vision of the Freedom Complex was Freedom Fields. And we've been able to put a soccer field in, still need to do some work on that, need to do work on baseball. But our vision for that property is Freedom Sports League to where not only can we take basketball and volleyball for the use of the gym, but we can go and, and do the same thing with soccer and the same thing with Little League Baseball. And, you know, we're just excited about what God has in store. Someday the school moving over there, finishing the school building and to see that property continuing to reach souls for the cause of Christ in years to come and uh, how exciting uh, it is. And by according to the preacher's own testimony, God's used freedom as much as any ministry in our church the last five years. And it's exciting to think that uh, God is allowing me to have a part in that ministry. What does the future hold for Fellowship Baptist Church? That little unnoticed baby that was born on the other side of the tracks in Catsburg is no longer a dependent infant. Now the world knows about her. 
Now FBC is a strong, mature, and thriving ministry, ready to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Like every responsible adult, Fellowship Baptist Church is doing what she can to help the younger ministries coming behind her. Through summer camps, youth conferences, and ladies' conferences, many younger churches and their people are being influenced for Christ. Young people are being sent out of FBC to train for the ministry. Many who have attended Fellowship Baptist Church and Fellowship Baptist Academy are serving as pastors, teachers, assistant pastors, and missionaries all around the world. God continues to use FBC as a beacon of hope in a very dark world. If the Lord tarries His coming, it is the desire of Pastor Rick Finley and the members of the church to continue to impact the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. 60 years, it sounds like a long time, and it is worthy of celebration, there's no doubt. And yet, as you think about the big picture, Jesus died 2,000 years ago, eternity's forever, and we're not done. For three score years, there's been a church right here preaching the gospel, and yet, we want to be faithful until the Lord returns. I believe with all my heart, some of our greatest days are still ahead of us as long as there are people who are willing to put Christ first, to serve Him with all their hearts, and to give their best for Him. I truly believe that the future is as bright as the promises of God.